serving up stories from the lacrosse field. Brought to you by Lacrosse Magazine. Produced by U.S. Lacrosse. Duke Lacrosse. Four years ago, those were dirty words in Durham. A stripper's false rape allegations, a district attorney's witch hunt, a university's knee-jerk reaction, a nation's scrutiny. The wounds are old, but the scars remain. Part of it will always be with us, and, and part of it keeps us centered and balanced to realize, you know, it's very fragile what we do, you know, and you can lose it in an instant. And some of the old feelings are still there, you know, for a lot of people on both sides, but not for the students. The students have, have taught us, I think, all a great lesson about moving forward and forgiveness and, and just, uh, you know, living your life. Seven players remain from that 2006 team. Seven players recruited by Mike Pressler, who were in the locker room when he vowed that the truth would set them free, only to see him get unceremoniously fired. Seven players who know what it's like to have a season pulled out from underneath them, to see three teammates suffer through a very public trial, to have the world root against you. They are, as Lacrosse Magazine pegged them, the Five Guys, the Blue Devils' last class of fifth-year seniors, awarded extra eligibility by the NCAA in the wake of that canceled season. Sam Payton remembers the party that led to a perfect storm and lessons learned from it. I mean, yeah, there are regrets. I think everyone who was involved, uh, you know, in the catalyst for that year and that uh, farce has regrets about that night, um, just because we put ourselves in a vulnerable situation, did some you know, things which we certainly regret doing. Uh, but in terms of life, life lessons from that, I think you know, that wasn't a problem that could be solved in a couple hours, a couple days, weeks. It took months and months of you know, kind of very proactively uh, rebranding ourselves individually in the program and getting out in Durham, in our hometowns, uh, you know, going back to our hometown, speaking to friends, uh, and you know, meeting new people and just kind of propagating this new idea of like who we are because the myth that it circulated was we were this you know, evil people, uh, which was very tough to fight. And like we've, we've talked about, you know, it's easy to believe that, easy to get caught up in hating Duke or in media hype or whatever it is. Uh, and so that was a problem that took months and years to kind of turn around. Uh, I think that's a valuable lesson that some problems can't be solved right away. They take years of diligence. By the time Duke returned to the lacrosse field and the sordid details of a rogue prosecution by disgraced Durham DA Mike Nifong unfolded, the Blue Devils became everyone's favorite vindication story. On April 11, 2007, David Evans, Colin Finnerty, and Reed Seligman were exonerated of all charges. Duke had a likable coach in Donowski, and a father-son story took center stage. Matt Donowski would win the Twarton Trophy as the nation's top player, and John Donowski would lead his team as a respected coach and father. I think Coach Donowski um, was the best guy for the job for a lot of different reasons, but most of all, just because he was the only coach in the country who was a father of the situation as well. Um, you know, seeing what Matt had gone through, um, also being Matt's dad, having a relationship with so many guys on the team, you know, kind of came in and it was a coach, but also a mentor and, you know, in some ways almost a father figure helping us through the situation. You know, I think for him to come, you know, being at a school like Hofstra where he was for so long, to come to Duke, you know, to help us out and help us through the situation is something where, you know, we all automatically, you know, had all, he had all of our faith and we all respected him. And, you know, I think without a doubt, he was the perfect guy for the job. And, uh, you know, he's done a perfect job ever since. Just put your hand on somebody. Here we go, all three teams, one, two, three. Team. But as John Donowski would say after an emotional loss to Johns Hopkins in the NCAA championship game, there are no fairy tale endings. The goodwill surrounding Duke lacrosse would subside two days after that loss when the NCAA announced a controversial decision to grant 33 players who were not seniors in 2006 an extra year of eligibility. Some openly criticized the NCAA's decision. It was okay to hate Duke again. Uh, you know, it, it is what it is. And, and I think that whatever happened in 2006, whatever those young men experienced, if getting an extra year an opportunity to go to school, to get an education, um, and, and to play lacrosse, to be with their friends for another year. They can, they're certainly, as far as I'm concerned, entitled to that. 
Some guys are going to leave with two degrees um, who, who made the best out of a very, you know, a very negative and a very bad situation, who made the best out of it. If people want to criticize uh, the situation, the NCAA, the university, you know, let them, but it's not about that. For us, it's about the individuals that were involved and, and that they're stronger, better people as a result of the experience. The Blue Devils have made three straight Final Four appearances, only to come away empty-handed each time. Can Duke's fifth-year seniors deliver in their final chance? I hope that our legacy is, you know, in June of this year, we can look back and say, you know, we you know, probably hit the low of the program in 2006 uh, and then the high of it in 2010. And, you know, that would be an awesome story. I think the, the thing for me that stands out is just the diversity of the players, the successful players, and the size differences. You know, if you take a, the top 10 players in college today, you got guys that are 5'8 and dominating the game, and you got guys that are 6'4 and dominating the game. And I just think, you know, it's so unique in that stick skills in lacrosse are so important, but once you master those stick skills, there's a position on the field for everybody, whether you're really slow, really fast, really big, really short, I think, and, and that to me is what makes it so unique and so, so cool. UMass headlines this week's NCAA Division I men's lacrosse coaches poll moving into the top 10 after big wins over Brown and Hofstra. The Minutemen are in Happy Valley on Saturday to face CAA foe Penn State. Five-time defending NCAA champion Northwestern reigns atop this week's Division I Women's Lacrosse Coaches Bowl, but don't look past ALC rival Vanderbilt. The Commodores have won six straight and come in at number 10. It's looking like do or die for Hopkins. The Blue Jays have lost four of five, and it doesn't get any easier with unbeaten UNC rolling into Homewood. Meanwhile, the top two teams in college women's lacrosse face major tests this weekend. Northwestern and Maryland are both on the road. The Terps visit Penn on Friday. The Wildcats are at Duke on Saturday. Follow the action this weekend and all season long at laxmagazine.com. You're on the cover of Lacrosse Magazine. Ned's on the cover <laughs> of Inside Lacrosse. Yeah. Who looks better? Uh, well, I feel like my photo is more generic in that it just kind of represents the fifth year guys, the whole team. So, I, and that has his helmet off in his, so. I would look better, <laughs> uh, but no, they're both very good looking, so it's all fun. Yeah, Gary loves me. Well, let me tell you a little bit about, let's talk laughs. 